welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, since you're standing, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. Since you're standing, why don't we just come before the Lord in in honor and reverence. Father, we come before you today, Lord, and we're just grateful for the opportunity that we have to come into the house of the Lord. Father, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. Lord, we don't come into this place to, to be entertained, but Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And Father, we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. And so, Father, it's in the name of Jesus that we ask your Holy Spirit to speak to us, to minister to us, to bring things to our remembrance, to open our eyes and our ears to see and hear the word as you would have us to hear this morning. And we thank you that it would be a seed sown on good ground. And Lord, that we would bear much fruit from it. And Father, the blessings that we ask upon ourselves, Lord, we don't ask just upon ourselves, but upon all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ today. And Lord, we thank you that you set your hand upon them and bless our brothers and sisters at no time do we see ourselves as better than anybody else, but but rather as co-laborers in the body of Christ, all working together to build the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Father, we glorify you, Father. We thank you that you set your hand upon our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Adventist brothers and sisters and our Presbyterian and Lutheran and Methodist brothers and sisters and our Episcopalian and, 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 and brothers and sisters. Lord, I ask that you set your hand on Harvest and on the Grove and on Sandals, on on the the Way World Outreach, Father. I ask that you bless in the name of Jesus, Harvest and Trinity and and, and Ecclesia, Lord, Oak Valley, Abundant uh, Living, Lord, churches all across the Inland Empire, so many to name, Father, and all around the world, Lord, we thank you that we are all many members of the same body, the body of Christ, working together to build and strengthen the kingdom of God. In Jesus' mighty name, all the glory and honor to you. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, hey, listen, as you're being seated, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Hebrews in the sixth chapter. Hebrews in the sixth chapter, we've got a lot to cover today. I'm excited for what God's got in store, and we're going to continue what we've been doing and studying the book of Hebrews. If you're just joining us, we go line upon line, precept upon precept. The title of this morning's message is The Elementary Principles of Christ. And we've been studying out of Hebrews in the 6th chapter, the first, first few verses. Pastor Jim, three weeks ago, if you weren't here, we have the sermon online as well as you can pick it up in a copy of a CD form uh, if you would like at the CD counter. But we have, uh, Pastor Jim started the first part of this message three weeks ago and then we had Easter services. So here we find ourselves resuming out of Hebrews in the 6th chapter, the first few verses, verses number 1 through number 3. So why don't we pick up and read verse number 1 out of Hebrews, the 6th chapter. The writer says, therefore leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ. Now, you're trained, you and I have been trained, if you've been at the church for any amount of time, to know that when you see therefore, it's there for a reason. And he's talking about chapter number 5 on the subject of spiritual maturity. We understand and we all recognize that it is God's will and God's desire design and desire for the church to not be spiritual babies, but rather to grow in their spiritual maturity of things of God. So here the author of Hebrews is saying, therefore, because it is God's design to be mature in things, let us leave behind the elementary principles. Going on, he says, uh, let us go on to perfection, meaning let us go on to maturity, Not laying again the foundation. The idea there is when you build something, you lay a foundation, you set it upon the rock. When you build a house, you don't pour a foundation and then come back again and pour a foundation again and then come back and pour a foundation. You build that foundation and once that foundation is established, then you begin to build on that. And so here the author is saying don't continue to lay the foundations or stay in the elementary principles, but rather move on to more mature thinking and more mature things. So let us not lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. These were the first two of six elementary principles we see here in Hebrews, the sixth chapter that we discussed three weeks ago. Verse number two goes on to say, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Verse number three says, and this we will do if God permits. So today we're talking about 
elementary principles of Christ. And we're going to discuss some things. Last three weeks ago, Pastor Jim talked about the first two of them being repentance from dead works, meaning turning away or not doing any longer the things that we once did before. Uh, repentance from our dead, our dead works in sense of repentance from our sins, but also repentance in our dead works, the works that don't do anything or build into the kingdom of God, the works that are, are null of, of spiritual or eternal importance. The second one is faith towards God. We know that the Bible tells us that without faith it is impossible to please God. Therefore you and I have got to live a life of faith. We may not like it. We may not want to. But we have got to live a life of faith. Now today we're going to continue and pick up on two more of the six of the elementary principles of Christ we see here in Hebrews in the sixth chapter. I want to encourage you today it's not necessarily much about inspiration as much as it is about information. If you've ever come to church and you want to know why do we do some of the things that we do, two of the principles today we're going to talk about today. So I want to encourage you, buckle up, strap in those seatbelts. If you've got them, you look at your seat and you say, I don't have seatbelts. It's okay, strap in your spiritual seatbelts. We're going to cover a lot of things and we're going to get into some things today. But I know that God is able and I know that God will speak to you today. Did you know that many churches across the world in America don't think that you're capable of learning or understanding these principles? But we know that God's design for us, His church, is is to grow in spiritual maturity. So therefore, through the grace of God, through the power of God, we're going to talk about some things today and we're going to get into them and we're going to discuss some elementary principles of Christ. So today, getting into the message number one, or actually technically speaking, this is number three uh, for the elementary principles of Christ. Number three for this afternoon or this morning is the doctrine of baptisms. The doctrine of baptisms. Now I'm being very careful in my word selection because if you read Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verse number two, as the author states, leaving the elementary principles and going on to perfection, talking about laying the foundation of repentance and, and, and faith towards God, the third thing he mentions in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verse number two is, we'll go ahead and put it up on the screen, is the doctrine of baptisms. Meaning that that word is a plural. Now the Bible tells us that we are all of one faith, all born into one family, one one God, one baptism. Yes, that is the baptism in the belief of Jesus Christ. But the Bible teaches us of a, of a few different types of baptisms that you and I experience and encounter in our life. Now, before we go any further, I want to just let you know that we're just giving you a brief overview. I wish we could spend more time discussing these subjects, but I'm going to lay some things out. And the wonderful thing is here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center, we have so many opportunities for you to learn more about these subjects throughout the week, throughout the weekend, and so forth and so on. We've got classes all the time to help teach you, encourage you, and grow in spiritual maturity. But as we get into the doctrine of baptisms, let's understand and let's discuss the word baptism. The word baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo. Now let me give you the, the definition. Baptizo means to immerse or to, to fully immerse or to get wet or to, 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 to submerge, to, to wash. The best description of the Greek word baptizo, believe it or not, came 200 years before Jesus Christ in a recipe to pickle. Wait, you're like, wait, Pastor Luke, you're bringing Jesus and pickling in the city? Yeah, let me tell you about it. In, in the Greek, the word baptizo was brought 200 B.C. in a recipe on how to make pickles. And here's the word. You take a cucumber and you wash it. Oftentimes we think of baptism as a washing. You wash the cucumber in water. But then the Greek word baptizo, the recipe was used that you baptizo or you submerge the pickle into vinegar and you allow it to sit so that the vinegar seeps in from the inside out and it begins to change the very nature of that cucumber into creating what you and I know as a pickle. So baptism means to wash, but it means to submerge. It means to, to overwhelm, to, 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 to come upon. And so there are two things in the Bible, in the New Testament, that teach us about baptism. Two doctrines in the New Testament. The first doctrine of the baptism is this. Baptism in water. Yeah, if you've ever been to a church, I don't think that you can find any church probably that, that does not do this or does not practice it. But it is common practice in the church to baptize into water. And what water baptism is, is an expression of your faith to God. 
A water baptism is an expression of your faith to God. The act of being baptized in water is a public expression of your faith declaring that the old man has been submerged and the new man now lives in Christ and for God. It's a public expression. Who are you making that expression of your faith to? Well, first and foremost, you're making that expression to anybody who is witnessing your baptism. Now, oftentimes churches will do that in a baptismal up front. The Rock Church and World Outreach Center, we have a, a fountain where we have water baptisms in our fountain. As a matter of fact, we'll have those next week. And what you're doing is you're making a public expression to man. But you're also making a public expression to God. Saying that this, no, this man who is, who goes down no longer is I, but now it is I who live in Christ. And also, did you know that you're making a public expression to the forces of darkness, the devil and his powers? Declaring, no longer do you have a grip or a hold on me, but now it is I who live through Christ Jesus who lives inside of me. So it is a public expression of our faith. Now, oftentimes you'll see different practices of baptism. Some people sprinkle water, some people pour water. We at the church believe, based on the definition of baptism, to submerge because it is an expression, a representation of the old man, the man who the, you once were, the person who you once were dying, being submerged, laid into the ground, laid below the surface, and then coming up, rising up, much like Jesus, on the third day, a new and resurrected person. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Romans in the 6th chapter. Romans in the 6th chapter, Paul the Apostle is speaking to the church on the very subject here of baptism. And in Romans in the 6th chapter, as you're turning, I'll start reading. It'll be up on the overhead if you didn't bring your Bible, but I want to encourage you to bring your Bible to church. Romans in the 6th chapter, Paul is speaking to the church in Rome and he says this. He says, or do you not know, verse number 3. As many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. Meaning when we are baptized, when we are submerged, it is an expression of our faith saying, it is I, my old self, being laid down below the surface, much like when Jesus Christ was crucified and laid in the tomb. We have died to ourselves, but because of the glory of the Father who raised Jesus from the dead, we also share in that. Verse number 5, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing that this, our old man, was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should be no longer slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ in baptism, if we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, verse number 9, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Jesus Christ died. He died to death once and for all, meaning that when he rose the life that he lives, Jesus did not yet again face death ever again once he rose. And now the author, Paul the Apostle, says in verse number 11, look what he says in verse number 11. He says, likewise, you and I, like Jesus Christ who died to the flesh through our salvation, now we are alive. Likewise, you also reckon or consider yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So baptism, when we go into the form of water baptism, when we are submerged in water and we are brought up, don't you know there's something about water baptism that happens? When you go into water, you go in one way. When you are water baptized, you come out another way. Let me describe it to you. You go in dry, and you come out wet. There is a change. But much like that physical change, there is a spiritual significance that's within you. As you go in the old, and you sig signify that that old is dead. And when you come up, you come up anew. The Bible says, likewise. You and I reckon ourselves, consider ourselves to be alive to God in Christ 
Jesus, we come up anew. We come up a new creation. And the scriptures that tell us that the old things have passed away and all, all things become new now apply to you and I. Why? Because we have been submerged. We have been submissive to the things of God in our life. So the act of being baptized is a public expression. The question is not whether should we be baptized, but why wouldn't we be baptized? Because the idea is this, is that is baptism exclusive to your salvation? And the answer to that is no. Let me tell you why. Because Jesus Christ, as he was on the cross, the thief next to him said, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus said to that thief, I surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Yet Jesus didn't take him off the cross and baptize him. You see, God is not limited by the expression of our faith. So baptism is not, is not essential to salvation, but rather an expression of salvation. So the question is not, should we be baptized, but rather, why wouldn't we be baptized? Why? Well, number one, Jesus Christ himself commands in the Great Commission that we go and make disciples, baptizing them. So if Jesus tells us to be baptized, hey, I think we ought to get baptized. Secondly, Jesus led by example, and he himself was baptized. And don't you know that if it's good enough for God, I'll tell you what, it's good enough for me and you. So the first doctrine of baptism is water baptism. The second doctrine of baptism is baptism in the Spirit. Jesus Christ in the book of John told uh, 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 Nicodemus, a religious leader, that what is born of flesh is flesh, what is born of spirit is spirit. Meaning that there are two parts of a man. There's the body and there's the spirit. So the water baptism or the baptism of water is an expression of the body. Now the baptism of the spirit is the baptism or filling of the inside of the spirit man. Undoubtedly, when you and I receive salvation, the Holy Spirit is within us. You cannot find salvation through Jesus Christ without the Spirit of God. But it's much like this. When you, when you are saved and you have to find your salvation, you have the Holy Spirit within you. But the act of spiritual baptism or baptism is in the Spirit is when you allow God to come upon you. Let me describe it to you like this. Put on your thinking caps. Put on your visual illustration. If you can, just go with me for a moment. If you were to take a glass of water and to fill it up in the sink with lovely San Bernardino tap water, and you were to drink that tap water, that water would now be where? Inside of you. Is everybody on the same page? No arguing there. You drink water, it goes inside. Right? It's not like the cartoons where it comes out of the... No, it goes inside. Now, if we were to go to the ocean, or let's say we were to go to a friend's swimming pool, and we were to get in the water, now the idea is, is that the water of the Holy Spirit is inside of you, right? But if you were to go into the ocean or into a swimming pool, you are now inside the water, or submerged, or surrounded, or enveloped in the water. And that is the idea of the Holy Spirit, is the, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you and I find salvation, we take, as it were, a drink of the Holy Spirit, and we have the Spirit of God within us. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the, is the chance or the opportunity for you and I to allow the Holy Spirit to be about us, to consume us, to indwell us, to surround us, to be all over. Here's the thing about the ocean. Here's the thing about the pool. If you don't get in the water, you don't get wet. It's a choice. You get in or you don't. The decision is yours. But look what Jesus says. If you've got your Bibles with you, turn with me a few pages back to the book of Acts. Acts in the first chapter. Let's read some statements from Jesus Christ, our Lord, as he speaks to the disciples. And Jesus says to the disciples, verse number 5 of the first chapter of Acts, John truly baptized with water. You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That's Acts, the first chapter, verse number 5. Jesus tells his disciples they will be baptized in the Spirit. Look what it says in verse number 8. It says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all and the ends of the earth. So Jesus Christ tells his disciples some things. He says, One, you will receive power from on high. Jesus says you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit, much like you were baptized in water. Now, coming back to John, the 20th chapter... 
as Jesus has resurrected from the dead, he looks to his disciples and he breathes on them and he says to his disciples, receive the Holy Spirit out of John the 20th chapter. So Jesus has told them, I have already promised in Acts, the uh, first chapter, fourth verse, which you have already heard, now the baptism will come upon you. And he says that they will receive power from on high. Now as you continue to read the story of the 120 disciples and apostles that were in the upper room, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit descended upon them as though a mighty rushing wind and there were tongues and flames of, of fire above their heads and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance and the wind, the Spirit of God came and fell upon them and now they were endued with that power from on high. Right afterwards there was a great commotion because of the noise and because of the commotion of the Holy Spirit coming upon them that many gathered around and here now the disciples endued with the power from God go out and preach and teach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and that day many multitudes are added to the church in its first day of existence. Here Peter, the one who, dis, who denied Jesus Christ some, some days earlier is now the one who jumps up and begins to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And look what Peter says in the second chapter in his sermons. We'll go ahead and put it up in Peter the sec, uh, Acts the second chapter. And in the, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in water. Water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse number 39, I don't know if I have it on the overhead, goes on to say, For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord will call, saying, signifying that the gift of the Holy Spirit is not just for that day, but for them and the generations to come, meaning that the gift and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for you and I today because it is God's will and God's desire for us to have the power of God inside of our lives and about us. So the Bible tells us that the baptism of the Holy Spirit came and they were endued with power. And they preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now the Bible also tells us that the, Holy, the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes after salvation. That in order to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, you first must be saved and believe in Jesus Christ. In Acts, the 8th chapter, there's a young man by the name of Philip preaching the word of God. And Philip is preaching the word of God. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts. I told you we were going through a lot of stuff today. And Philip is preaching the word of God. In verse number 12, it says, But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed and was baptized, and he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing miracles and signs which were done. Now the Bible will go on to describe this man Simon as a sorcerer, a man who made it his business to impress people with powers. And so here's this man that had made it his business to impress people with magical powers and things of that nature. And the Bible says that he was amazed by what Philip was teaching and followed Philip. Now look what it goes on to say. Talking about baptism of the Spirit comes after salvation. Verse number 14, now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John, whom, they had, whom when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Look at this, verse number 16, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse number 17, then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now it goes on to say that Simon saw the power of the disciples or the apostles as they laid hands and they got the power of the Holy Spirit. Now you remember, Jesus told his disciples that they would be endued from power with on high. So here's a man that was amazed at the truth that Philip was teaching, but now he sees the power of God and it goes on to say that he asks the disciples, he asks the apostles, what can I do to buy this power? Meaning that the, 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 the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes, for one, after salvation. They were baptized, but they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. Secondly, confirming that it is a power from on high that comes about. Now the baptism or the, the salvation, the Holy Spirit being inside of us during salvation is a benefit to you and I. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit coming upon us or being immersed in us is a benefit to others to be witnesses. Simon was amazed, but he, was, he, was, he, he wanted the power of the, of the apostles. 
the, the Bible tells us that the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is evidenced by the speaking of tongues all throughout the Bible, all throughout the book of Acts. The Bible tells us this. As a matter of fact, let's look at what the Bible says. In Mark, the 16th chapter, if you're just writing notes, you can jot it down. Jesus tells his disciples that in my name you will cast out demons, he says, and then he follows it by, you will speak in other tongues. In Acts, the second chapter, as the Holy Spirit falls upon those in the upper room, the Bible tells us that they spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Meaning as the Spirit gave them direction, they became the vessels and they spoke in other tongues. The Bible goes on to say in Acts the 10th chapter, as Peter was preaching, that the Holy Spirit fell among Jews and the Gentiles together and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues and many marveled. The Bible goes on to tell us in Acts the 19th chapter that Paul laid hands on the people in Corinth and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues and began to prophesy. In Acts the ninth chapter, a man by the name of Ananias lays his hands on a man by the name of Saul later to become Paul and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible doesn't follow it with Paul receiving the Holy Spirit at that moment, which I believe he did. But rather, the Bible goes on to tell us Paul himself in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, Paul the Apostle dedicates an entire chapter dedicated to the very subject of the baptism of the Holy Spirit as evidenced in the speaking of tongues. And Paul himself makes the statement saying, I am glad that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Meaning that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is evidenced by the speaking of tongues. The Bible goes on to say that we speak in languages that we don't understand, but the soul is edified. There have been numerous occasions in the baptism of the Holy Spirit where people have begun to speak in languages that they did not know. And in Acts, it's, one, it's backed up in the book of Acts, where people begin to speak in the native language of another person, and they hear the gospel. The person has no clue. The Spirit is giving them the utterance through the baptism. The Spirit is giving them utterance, and they're speaking into a foreign language, but somebody is listening to that language and making sense to them, and they heard and received the gospel of Jesus. Jesus Christ. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a benefit to others as a witness, Jesus tells us. I wish we could spend more time on this, but we have classes here at the Rock Church. We have the Holy Spirit class once a month. We have all sorts of different avenues for you to learn about these things more in depth. But listen to this. How does one get the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, simply like baptism of, uh, uh, in water, you go, you get submerged, you come back up, that's baptism. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is a very simple process, and here it is. Number one, to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you first must believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and is the Messiah, the one and only true living God, the Son of God. Secondly, you've got to ask for it. Jesus Christ in Luke, the 11th chapter, says, you being carnal parents, if your children ask you for something, won't you give it to them? He says, how much more will God then, the Holy Father, give to you the Holy Spirit when you ask? And number three, you've got to practice. You can't receive the gift, and if you don't apply the gift to your life, what good does it do? Much like as if I was to tell you, hey, I've got $100 for you as a gift. And you were to say, well, I appreciate that gift of $100. I receive it, but you hold on to it. You keep it for me, and that way I don't ever have to deal with it. But thank you for the gift. I got it. What benefit is that $100 to you if you don't do anything with it, if you don't spend it? And so the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit came as the Spirit gave them utterance. They spoke. So you got to open your mouth. you got to allow God to be about you, to allow God to fill you, to allow God to use you. And you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, again, I said we've got examples and illustrations all on teaching classes. We want to give you the opportunity later today. If you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, hey, listen, I don't want to leave today without giving you the opportunity. So we'll have prayer teams up here in the front after service. We have a prayer class right after service, a, a prayer session for 15 minutes. We pray right after church service. You can go in there and we'll pray for you and for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I promise you, your life will never be the same because you will be endued with power from on high. But for the sake of time, let us move on to the next principle of Christ. And that is number four, the laying on of hands. Have you ever, want, have you ever wondered when you come to church and the pastor says, does anybody need prayer? Does anybody need healing? And somebody puts their hand on them. I don't know about you. I don't, there are people that are touchy-feely. They just like to touch people. And, oh, you know, they come up and they get the massages. And people are like, oh. 
I don't know about you. I'm not one of the touchy-feely people. I don't like to be touched. I don't like massages. You know, when you go to amusement parks or you wait in line, you got to have that, that personal bubble of space that us Americans like to have. I, it's, it, it's, it's something about it. But you come to church and people are touching and they're laying hands and they're holding hands. Why do we do that? <laughs> Let me explain it to you. In the Old Testament, the laying on of the hands was a significant event because it was the transfer of power. It was the transfer of authority. It was the transfer of blessing from one party to the next. Meaning it was an important event. As, let me give you some examples in the Bible. We'll just throw them up on the overhead because we got to go quickly through that. But in Exodus in the 29th chapter, God describes, God instructs Aaron and his, son, and his sons during the sacrifice to lay their hands on the head of the bull. Meaning the significance there was to put your hands on that which was being sacrificed so that the power, so that the, the, the sins that, that you had would be transferred or be represented to this sacrifice so that you could be made clean. Now obviously you and I don't participate in animal sacrifices today in the New Testament. Thank God Jesus Christ was the last great sacrifice for you and I. But the laying on of hands is still applicable to the church today. And let me show you some reasons why. It is used for ordination or consecration. In Acts, the sixth chapter, there were some, uh, the apostles found themselves in need to, 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 to train up and to, uh, to anoint and to, to consecrate some leaders to take care of the widows in the church. In Acts, the sixth chapter, verse number six, it says, whom they set before, those who had been chosen, they set before the apostle, and when they had prayed, the apostles laid hands on them, signifying that we give them our blessing, we give them our consecration, we give them the anointing of God to do what God has called them to do. Paul the Apostle exhorts the young pastor Timothy to not neglect the gift that was given to him by the laying on of hands. So it can be used as a form of consecration or anointing. How about for blessing? Jesus Christ touched people as he blessed them. The Bible tells us in Matthew the 19th chapter that some children came to Jesus that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. Verse number 14 goes on. Jesus said, let the little, little children come to me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And verse number 15 goes on to say that he laid his hands on them and blessed them and departed. It was important for them not to just come and see Jesus, but to come and be touched by Jesus because of the transfer, the power, the anointing, the blessing, the healing. Speaking of healing, in Acts the ninth chapter, a man by the name of Ananias, we talked about this, came and he said to Paul, the Lord has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, Paul, Ananias came and laid hands on Paul because he was blinded on the road to Damascus when he saw Jesus Christ. So Paul was blind. And the Bible goes on to say that when Ananias prayed and laid hands over him, it was as if, as if scales fell off his eyes and he received his sight. Jesus Christ on multiple occasions for healing touched people. He touched the leper, the person that was not not supposed to be touched. He was unclean. Now, is it exclusive? Obviously not. Jesus healed many. The Bible tells us that people were healed when the shadow of Peter walked over them or crossed over them. It's not exclusive, but it's a transfer of power, of anointing. How about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? We read that in Acts, the eighth chapter, that the apostles came and laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So you see, it's not exclusive that the power of the transfer comes, but it's important, and here's why. Because Christianity has been and always will be a personal encounter. You see, it, we live in a day of, of social media. We live in a day of text messages. We live in a day of blogs and, and, and iPhones and Androids and smart devices and computers and all sorts of things. But did you know that when the first church came that they didn't have iPhones? Did you know that when the first church was in existence, that they didn't have Facebook? That the word of God was spread through the encounter, through the words of men, through the personal touch. Because people would lay hands and people would be healed and people would see people being healed because people would lay hands and they would say, I want that. People would lay hands and they'd be filled with the Spirit and they would be a witness and say, wow, they're doing something that nobody else is doing. That's got to be from God. And they would get, and the church would grow. Because Christianity has and always will be. Facebook is great. Text messages are great. Hey, billboards are wonderful. Television commercials, 
great. Yellow book ads, great way to get the word of God out. But did you know the most effective way to get somebody into church is not a billboard, is not a yellow page ad, is not Facebook, is not texting them, but is a personal invitation because that is the will of God. That is the design of God. And the laying on of hands forces you and I to step out of our comfort zone and to reach out and touch somebody. See, the power is not in the hands. Understand this. It's not like that Volkswagen commercial. If you ever saw a little boy running around with a Darth Vader helmet, trying to put the force on everything, and he was trying to move everything, and he wasn't, and the dad came home, and he pulled up, and his car had a remote start. He runs into the kitchen, and the boy runs outside, and he tries to throw the force on the car, and dad hits the button, and the car starts, and the boy looks over, and he looks at his hands. <laughs> it's not like the power is in you, like, woo! Okay, the power is not in the hands. But the power is coming alongside of, coming in agreement with the will and the word of God. And, in, and, in, and the power of God that lives inside of you when you come into the agreement of God and you lay hands, what you're doing is you're signifying that I bless, I come in agreement, and the power that is within me, may it go into you because God is able, not me, but it is God. So understand, church, it's not the hands. Oh, how it would be great if it were. But it's the power of God within us and the anointing of God. Now, before we close, I have to say this, that the Bible does warn us to not be hasty in laying on of hands. Don't go about and be like, hey, I learned about laying on hands. Come here, 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 come here. <laughs> because the Bible says you and I have got to know those who labor among you. And let me give you this illustration. When you buy a car, when you get into an agreement, oftentimes tradition says you shake somebody's hand. And that is a form of agreement. That is a form saying, I come into agreement, and now you and I are aligned. And Paul warns the pastor, Timothy, to don't be hasty into laying on of hands to bless people because, hey, when you do so, what you're signifying, the transfer of power, the transfer of authorities, you're signifying, hey, I come into agreement with what you're doing. But if you don't know what they're doing, guess what? That sets you up because you have said, I come into line in alignment with them. So to know those who labor among you. Well, does that mean that if somebody says, well, I want prayer, can you pray for me? To be like, mm. you know, i got to wait. Let me look at you. Come back in a week and I'll pray. No, 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 no. See, but when somebody comes and says, will you bless me? Will you send me out? Will you come into agreement with this? You ought to be cautious and know their character, know the spirit of God that is inside of them and know where they're at. Let their actions, let their works, their faith that has works speak louder than their actions. And so the Bible warns us to not be hasty about laying on of hands, but to take it serious. It is a personal touch. It is a transfer of the power of God from the inside of us to the inside of somebody else. So today we talked about two elemental principles of Christ. Number one, we talked about the doctrine of baptisms, baptism in water. Hey, good for you. Guess what? We didn't even plan this. Didn't even know the timing. Next week. It's water baptisms. The question isn't, should you be water baptized? But why not? But rather, why wouldn't you be water baptized? See, if we had water baptisms, water baptisms today, you know what that means? That means you all have to go out there in your Sunday best and get dipped. But now we've given you the opportunity to go out, get your bathing suit, come back, bring it to church with you, bring your chanclas or your sandals with you. And now you can be baptized. Next week, after second and third service, as well as after Sabbath service. We, secondly, we talked about the baptism of spirit. We have so many opportunities. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit today, right up front after service, we'll have prayer teams. We have a class that meets in the chapel or a prayer session in the chapel right after today's service that will pray with you to receive the Holy Spirit. It's your choice. All you have to do is get in. Just got to get in. Thirdly, today we talked about Laying on of hands. It's a personal touch. It's an encounter person to person. That's the way God has designed it. It is a transfer of authority from one to the next. From the God inside of you and the power of God on the inside of you to those who you believe and bless. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? Oh, praise God. Let me ask you to do something. Please give me a moment more of your attention. Let me ask some questions. Let me ask you a question. It would be a shame for us to get together, to have worship, to, to praise God, to hear the word of God, and not give you the opportunity to examine your eternal position with God. So let me ask you this question, and why don't you answer it within your own heart? You see, nobody will know the answer except God and you. If you were to leave this place today and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a relatively simple question. Why don't you 
why don't we go over some of the answers that you might have. You know, you might say, Pastor Luke, I hope I get to heaven. I want to get to heaven. I think I'm going to go. Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can hope, that you can think, or that you can want to get into heaven, that you can't get there that way? Nowhere does it say, I think I can, I think I can, that God says you're going to get in there. Did you know, some of you might even say, Pastor Luke, to be honest with you, I don't know where I stand on the belief of heaven and hell. Just because you don't believe in something doesn't mean it's not real. You know, oftentimes uh, we, we think that because we can't see, feel, or touch something that it's not real. But I want to submit this to you. You know, you can't see the air, but it's real. They used to think that the earth was flat, but it's round. But because you think something is true doesn't mean it's not and vice versa. The Bible tells us that hell is a real place, that heaven is a real place. And it's time for somebody to love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough to not play games, not beat around the bush, and to tell you that heaven is a real place and hell is a real place. And it's time for us to get serious about it. Did you know you can't get to heaven because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, a Hindu, a Muslim, or any other type of world religion? So that means by default you're going to get to heaven? Can't get there that way. Did you know that because your parents told you you were a Christian because you were baptized as a baby or christened? Remember we talked about baptism not being exclusive, but an expression of salvation. Did you know you can't get to heaven because you attended church or Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes? Nowhere in the Bible where you find that because you went to church, because your parents told you you were a Christian, because you got a cross or St. Christopher around your neck, hey, because you've even got a Jesus tattoo somewhere on your body doesn't mean anywhere you're going to get into heaven. You can't get to heaven that way. Did you know you can't get to heaven because you're a good person? Wait a minute. Pastor Luke, good people go to heaven. All my life I lived that. I've never robbed a 7-Eleven. I've never cheated on my taxes. I don't drive fast on the freeway. I've done more good in my life than bad. That's great. I'm glad. But did you know that the Bible tells us that our good works, according to God, are like filthy rags? Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. You can't get to heaven because you're a good person. It's in the Bible. Well, you know what, but Pastor Luke, I, I, I served in the church. I carried my pastor's Bible. I, I, you know, I sang in the choir. I worked in the children's of the youth ministries. Doesn't that mean something? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you served in the church, because you carried the pastor's Bible, because you served in ministry or youth ministry, or you got a card in your wallet that says you're a member of a church, nowhere will you find that that's going to get you into heaven because there's more to it than that. Here's the reality is that it's God's heaven. The only way to get there is God's way, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except through him. So we can't go to heaven your way, can't go to heaven my way, or well-meaning church committee, or author's way. The only way you and I can find ourselves in heaven with God for eternity is God's way. And Jesus, speaking to a religious leader of his day, we talked about this in John the third chapter, said that you must be born again. Now, you've heard that term, you think, oh man, Hollywood's made that, you know, we, I've heard, always heard that as like radical, weirdo, crazy, out of control Christianity. Is that what you're trying to talk about? I don't care what Hollywood said. I don't care what popular culture or society has made it out to be. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, the term born again has always meant the same thing in the eyes of God. And here it is. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. God is after an all or nothing relationship with you. Let me prove it to you in the Bible, in the book of the Revelation. Jesus Christ is speaking to the church, and he says to the church, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow, shocking statement. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let's describe that term. Lukewarm, you think about it like this, it's like a, a warm soda on a hot day. It just doesn't do the job. In terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out, a little bit up and a little bit down. You're kind of floating around, doing your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You got too much of God in you and too much of the world in you to enjoy either one of them, and you're riding the fence. And Jesus Christ says, if that's you, you are mistaken, deceived in thinking that you're going to make it into the, in the kingdom of heaven. So then how do we do it? Well, the only way you and I can do it is God's way because it's God's heaven, it's God's way. And Jesus Christ said that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. So in a moment, I want to give you that opportunity. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of them, I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on the Bible, just like that, real loud. I want to get your attention. What I want you to do, if that's you in this place, I want to give you the opportunity. When I smack my hand on the Bible, to put your hand up. Please, nobody else get up. Please, respect the honoring of the Lord right now. Please. 
When I count to three, I want to ask you to do something. If that's you in this place, I want to ask you, pop your hand up. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, you know what? I want to give Jesus Christ all of my heart. I want to give him all of my life. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge it. Put it right back down. We'll go forward from there. And what you're doing is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to go forward in my relationship with God. You say, Pastor Luke, I don't know if I'm going to be able to raise my hand. I'll be embarrassed. Somebody might see me. Hey, you know what? Somebody might see you. You might be embarrassed. But wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward in your relationship with God? You see, the decision is yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way in. The truth is, is that God has already done everything he could to ensure you find yourself in heaven by giving Jesus Christ to die for your sins, a beaten, bloody mess, a spectacle to hang on the cross. And now in return, he wants all of your heart and all of your life. The decision's yours. Who should raise their hand? If you've never given him all your heart, if you've never given him all your life, in just a moment, when I count to three, pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, and put it right back down. Who should raise your hand if you're not sure? You've done this maybe as a kid or you don't know. Get your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, put it right back down, and we'll move forward from there. Maybe you did this at a Harvest Crusader, a Billy Graham Crusader, did it on TV, but you never really followed through with it. Today, let's give you the opportunity to go forward for God. Who should raise their hand? Finally, today, if that's you in this place, living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God, sing, running from God instead of to God. Today, let's make it the day you go forward for God and ensure your place in heaven with God forever, leaving hell behind. Don't find yourself there. Don't find yourself to see. Today is the day of your salvation. Don't miss out on this opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. If that's you, get your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. And we'll move forward from there. We'll pray together in just a moment. But if that's you, Hands are getting ready to go up. If you're watching in the Love Rock Cafe or in the outer foyer, watch it by TV. If you're hearing my voice in the, in, the, in the campus all around, stop what you're doing and put your hand up. Somebody will see it. Go see an usher. If you're in the Love Rock Cafe or somebody out, and, and we'll, 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 we'll address that in just a moment. But if that's you in this place, get ready. Hands are getting ready to go up. Today is the day of your salvation. I'm going to count. Here we go. Get ready. Today is the day of your salvation. Ready? One, two, three. Three, let me see your hands in the house today. Where are you guys at? I see you. One, right there. Two, I see you right there. Three, I see you right there. Four, I see you. Five, I see you. Let me see your hands. If you got your hand, I got to see your hands. Six, I see you. Seven, I see you. Seven, eight in the family room. I see you. Anybody in the family room over there? Nine, I see you in the family room. I see you. All right, ten, I see you back there. Ten wise people. Eleven, I see you right there, right in the back. Eleven wise people. Anybody else in this place today, you say, I want to give Jesus Christ all of my heart. I see an usher pointing over there. I see you. Twelve back there. 12 wise people, 13, I see you right there. 13 wise people, anybody else in the house today say, man, I wonder if I should listen. It's not about what a man says. I see an usher point. Where are you at? Give me a look. Two or one? Oh, 14, 15, praise God. The Bible says it's the goodness of God. God is calling you today to make the decision. Everybody's pointing in one direction. Where are you at? 15 wise people. Are you all pointing over here? 16, all right, I see you back there. 16 wise people. The Spirit of God speaking to people in this place. saying, man, I wonder if I should. Come on. Today is your day of salvation. Don't miss this opportunity. Go forward for God. Anybody else? 16 wise people. Hey, I didn't embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you. Anybody else? Come on. Let's go forward for God in your place today. Say, man, I wonder if this guy's ever going to stop talking. Maybe if you raise your hand. 16 wise people. Anybody else in the, pla in the place today? 16 wise people. Well, praise God for 16 wise people. Hallelujah. <laughs> Here's what I want to do. From the front to the back, from side to side, wherever you're at in the Love Rock Cafe, in the foyer, wherever you're at, if you raised your hand, you don't get saved. Remember I said you acknowledge that you want to give him all your heart real life. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be the personal Lord and Savior of your life. So let us do that. We want to change destinies. Let us pray with you. We've got some things that we want to get into your hands. If you're serious about this today, I want you to take a bold step. If you're, whether you're in the family room or in the front row, it doesn't matter. I want you to take a bold step. As we all stand and sing a song together, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair and come and meet me at the altar. And let's change destinies together right now. As they come forward, Lord, please nobody leave as they come forward if that's you come on you can come come on if that's you you can come from the family rooms from the back from the front wherever you're at come on you can come come on if that's you you come for those of you in the back you come come on if you raise your hand come on Come on, come on down, come home to Jesus.
We'll wait for you. You come. Come on. Even the reason that I live, the reason that I do. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hey, guys, listen. Today is a new day. Hey, you're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today's the first day of the rest of your life. And here's what we're going to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here? This is Pastor Joe. Pastor Joe is a, he's a good-looking guy right over there. Pastor Joe is one of our young adults pastors here. And he's going to do a couple things. He's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. Listen, I assure you I'm as weird as it gets here, okay? He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to give you some free information, some literature that we have to help get you strong in the things of God. Hey, you just got saved. Now what, now what do you do? We want to help you with that. And the third thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a friend. Hey, we give out friends here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We call them spiritual personal trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you see a personal trainer. They help you build those muscles. Make sure you don't waste your time. We've got personal trainers. Somebody that will come alongside of you. They'll buy you a cup of coffee for a couple of weeks in the Love Rock Cafe. Teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong in the things of God so you don't go back to the life that you came from. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, go right over here with Pastor Joe.